For nearly a decade, Apple has been the most valuable publicly traded company in the world. They were the first to make computers look sexy. With its revolutionary products and services, it's transformed the way we live and shaped the culture of the 21st century. You can't walk down the street without seeing someone wearing an Apple Watch or using an iPhone or an iPad. But things haven't always gone to plan for Apple. Apple was dying. They weren't making it at all. It was a company in great turmoil. He destroyed everything I'd spent 10 years working for. Apple was on the verge of bankruptcy. Anybody could tell, gee, there's a lot of liabilities on this balance sheet. They were bleeding money. They couldn't compete with cheaper competitors. It was just losing astronomical amounts of money. This is the story of how Apple very nearly crumbled, told by people who witnessed the company's fall firsthand and were close to the man who managed to turn it into one of the world's most valuable brands. With an annual turnover of over 200 billion US dollars, 123,000 employees, over 500 stores, and over a billion products in use globally, Apple is one of the world's most successful businesses. Its genius for innovative design, disruptive technology, and marketing has built a customer base that reveres Apple with almost religious fanaticism. I'm a lifer. I'm an Apple lifer. Everyone in my family also uses Apple. It's easy once you start with the Apple products. It's the number one company in the world. I hope I will stay with Apple forever. The story of Apple is a roller coaster drama that took the company to the brink of bankruptcy and on to global domination. But it all began in a garage in Los Altos, California, where two 20-something computer nerds, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, formed a company making basic kit computers on April Fool's Day, 1976. Steve Wozniak was always, early on, he was the kind of the, the, the technical brains behind the Apple computer, the engineering kind of brains behind Apple. Steve Jobs was the slick marketer. He was the person who thought, you know, we can't just sell this to a small group of geeks who are interested in buying personal computers. This is something that could appeal to everyone. With a 250,000 US dollar investment from Mike Markula, a former executive of Intel, Jobs and Wozniak launched the Apple II computer. The Apple II, small, inexpensive, simple to use. One of the world's first microcomputers, it had a built-in keyboard and offered high-resolution color graphics and sound. It was designed to look more like an appliance than a traditional bulky business computer. Apple pretty much was one of the inventors of the personal computer industry, it was one of the first companies to introduce one of these products. The Apple II was Apple's first kind of breakthrough hit. It was launched in 1977, and some version of it wound up running until 1993, which gives you an idea of just how big a product this was. Thanks to the Apple II, Apple's yearly sales grew from 774,000 to 118 million US dollars, an average annual growth rate of 533%. They were growing very, very rapidly as a company. But, I mean, Apple was founded in a garage, and within a few years, it's employing thousands of people. In December 1980, Apple was listed on the Nasdaq stock market. The shares sold out almost immediately. Instantly, about 300 millionaires were created. Steve Jobs, the largest shareholder, made 217 million US dollars. In four years, Apple had grown exponentially. Steve Wozniak continued to work in engineering until a plane accident and disillusionment with the increasingly corporate ambitions of the company led to his departure in 1985. I go to business meetings and they're all sitting there in three-piece suits. It's a large business, there's a lot of dollars involved. The people who have come out of school trained to run and manage business is the key element today, and that's where most of the creativity is going.
Steve Jobs became Apple's lead visionary. He had this vision to build great products that would change the world, and he always called them appliances. Does it mean that every housewife will ultimately be a programmer? Well, as you see from the apple, it weighs about 12 pounds. And one of the nice things about handling it is if you don't like what it's doing, you can throw it out the window. <laughs> he didn't call them computers, and he wanted to build appliances that people would put in their homes and would look at fondly from a design perspective, but that they would also be incredibly useful. He wanted things to be so easy to use that you just didn't even feel like you were using them, that you were, they just became part of you. Apple has been part of Paul Mark Davis's life for over 20 years. His unofficial Apple Museum in London has an almost unparalleled collection of vintage machines. Apple machines were so much more beautiful than, than the, the PC alternative. There was no comparable model outside of Apple. Here goes nothing. So I kind of got all of my old Macs out that I've been sort of collecting over the years and put them all together, all these various machines from different decades. I wanted to have every single machine. Isn't that amazing? It's working fine. This is a real mixture of, of, of stuff. I mean, there's the, the, the Apple Lisa up there, there's an Apple II. One of the most notorious objects in Paul's collection lurks in a special place. OK. Right above his bathroom. The Apple III. <laughs> it is a huge, useless non-working lump. I mean, most of the machines in here do work, and in my defense, this probably stopped working about <laughs> six weeks after it was bought. The Apple III was launched in 1980, and hopes were that it would emulate the success of the Apple II. My Apple is my manager. But it went into the history books as the company's first big failure. The Apple III was disastrous. Early on, it ran into technical problems, and, and one of Apple's uh, official solutions for it was that you should lift the computer up about three or four inches and drop it, because this would hopefully reseat the chips inside it. Um, and so that's a failure. Wounded by the disaster of the Apple III, there was worse news to come. IBM put a lot of what it knows about computers into the new IBM in August 1981, IBM launched its personal computer, or PC. It was the opening salvo in the PC versus Apple war that would rage for decades. The IBM personal computer coming to selected stores across the country. You get giants like IBM, which then come along and think, oh, this is a fast-growing product category. There's probably some money to be made there. So Apple faces more competition. So I would say that that's probably the main challenge that they were facing at the time. Aware that Apple desperately needed a new hit, Steve Jobs set up a group of 100 people to work on a top-secret project. Andy Cunningham was one of the chosen few. He hand-selected his team of 100 people, and he only allowed a very small number of outside people to be part of that team. And we had special badges to get into the building, and you were not allowed in there if you weren't one of those people. So you were living with these people, going through the process of working with Steve Jobs, which was grueling and difficult. He knew what he wanted in his head, and he, he would communicate that to you, and if you didn't make it happen, he'd basically scream and yell, and sometimes throw things and, and insult you, insult you if you, couldn't, if you couldn't do it. All of the images you are about to see on the large screen will be generated by what's in that bag. Knowing that Apple's fortunes were riding on it, Jobs pushed his team of 100 to create a computer that he believed would change the world, the Macintosh. Launched in January 1984, the Macintosh was the first mass-marketed computer to have a mouse and an on-screen desktop interface, all packaged in a radical form factor. You could consider the Macintosh Steve's baby. That was his child. Absolutely no difference between that product and a child. 
But one day I asked him, I said, what are you trying to do with the Macintosh product and, and, and its relationship with its users? And he said, I want to put a mother in every box. I want people to open up the Macintosh box and I want them to feel like this product is taking care of them and not that they have to take care of it. It was the first computer that felt truly intuitive. It was the first computer that meant that you could use it without training. That's the revolution in computers. The real genius of Macintosh is that you don't have to be a genius to use it. The advertising was compelling, but the Macintosh failed to do the one thing it needed to do, get people to buy it. We realized that nobody's buying it. They loved the ad, they loved Steve Jobs, they loved talking about it in the press, but they didn't, they weren't buying the product. The Macintosh was too expensive for struggling creatives and too unorthodox for businesses who preferred more established rivals like IBM. People who work in corporate jobs, who go to work every day in suits and ties, it wasn't attractive to business people. They're not attracted by that, <laughs> by that image. So it's almost like we mispositioned the product, if you will. The Macintosh struggled commercially, and this drove a wedge between Steve Jobs and John Scully, the CEO who Jobs had lured from Pepsi in 1983 to bring structure to the infamously unstructured Apple. I think when John joined the company, it was like a miracle for everyone because people saw him as adult supervision, including Steve. And uh, the, he has the famous quote, you know, do you wanna go on selling sugar water to kids or do you wanna come and change the world? And John, of course, chose the decision to come and change the world. And I think John thought that he would come and, and play a typical CEO role. You know, he had come from Pepsi, and that was a very well-structured consumer company. And he goes to Apple, and it's not very well-structured, not very well-structured at all. And Steve was still making all the big decisions. And it was very difficult, I think, for John to deal with that. And Macintosh was failing. It's not like he launched this product and all of a sudden they were making gazillions of dollars on it. That was not happening at all. It was costing the company a ton of money to have that product. And Steve was just insistent. We, we, must, we must make this go. This must happen. And John, John was ready to pull the plug. You know, I don't think so. I don't think we need the Macintosh. It's killing us. Without the success of the Macintosh in business, we couldn't afford the huge investment we have in research and development. It was crunch time for Apple, and a battle ensued between Scully and Jobs. Steve Jobs actually tried to drum up support to sort of wrestle control away from John Scully. John Scully, who came from a very corporate background, was maybe far better sort of as a corporate infighter than Steve Jobs was able to win that tussle. The Apple board sided with Scully and sidelined Jobs. On the 12th of September, 1985, Steve Jobs was forced to resign from the company he'd founded. What can I say? I hired the wrong guy. That was Scully? Yeah. And uh, he destroyed everything I'd spent 10 years working for. Sometimes you think you're doing the right thing by removing a, a force that appears to be a negative force, when in fact that's the life force. <laughs> and what you really needed to do is, is feed that life force in a way that was going to work. And they weren't able to do that. I think they thought, thank God he's gone. Well, now we can run a business. But you know, Apple isn't a business. I mean, it is a business, but it, it, it was the realization of a, of, a, of a vision and a person behind that vision. And Apple had it, and when they kicked Steve out, they lost it. And so lots of things started to fall apart, lots and lots. Steve Jobs wanted to change the world with Apple computers, and when he left the company, its very soul was ripped out. Over the next decade, this would lead to problem after problem. revolutionized the computer industry in the late 1970s. This is my Apple. But nearly a decade of hit and miss products had left it commercially fragile. Steve Jobs' passion project, the Macintosh, had failed to turn Apple's fortunes around and caused divisions within the company. In 1985, Steve Jobs was ousted from the company he had co-founded. Everyone who was working for Apple would have realized at the time that Steve Jobs leaving the company was detrimental. To make things worse, that same year, Microsoft launched Windows, its own version of a graphical user interface 
that worked on IBM's personal computer or any computer with an Intel chip. When Microsoft comes along and starts taking some of what Apple's doing and applying it to, uh, to the PC, and that's the point at which the, the balance tips away from Apple. With a wider range of hardware, software and prices, Intel computers running Windows software, the so-called Wintel sector, quickly overtook Apple's share of the market. Beginning about 1988, the platform share of Apple was going progressively down, and it actually sunk below 10% around 1991, 1992. And an incredible top-down decision that was made at that time it was decided, let's go up and crank up the entire supply chain. And literally a calculation was done on how many computers needed to be bought and sold to get Apple's market share up to like 11, 12%. And Apple committed to all that inventory. Apple didn't sell it, didn't come close. I think that's the first time the company realized it really was losing the Wintel war. And if you look back at the pricing, it's pretty clear why, because Apple products were selling at a premium to the Wintel products. The consumers are not stupid. And they would look at this and say, I really like Apple. I really want to buy Apple, but I just can't justify it personally. Despite struggling with finances, Apple didn't stop innovating. One of its most ambitious projects came out in 1993, a handheld device called the Newton Message Pad. Helping people keep in touch. The idea behind Newton is that it's an assistant, something that actively helps you as you capture, organize, and communicate your ideas and information. The Newton is a great example of everything that was good about Apple and bad about Apple in the early 1990s. The Newton was really, in some ways, a prototype iPhone, except that it couldn't make phone calls. It was a handheld computer at a time where even laptops were still incredibly bulky things. It used artificial intelligence, it had all of these amazing features. You could write on it with a stylus, and the idea was that it would then be able to kind of recognize what you were writing and turn that into computer text, which for 1993 is an incredibly ambitious project, but unfortunately it turned out to be too ambitious. You know, Newton's pretty smart, but it's not always going to get your handwriting right. Like the does. handwriting into text didn't work very well. People were disappointed at that. So you really had something that was really hard to use and expensive. And those two things made it a failure really right out of the launch. You know, it just, it never took on at all, even amongst the hardcore Apple, Apple lovers. It just didn't work. When you're done, Newton even has a smart way of getting rid of your trash. Apple was panicking, but instead of consolidating, it continued to bring out different products. They were bleeding money. They couldn't compete with cheaper competitors. They were making too many products. They were trying to do high-end, middle, lower-end, a diversity of models to cater to all the consumers. And so they lost their focus. In 1993, the Apple board forced out CEO John Scully, but two successive CEOs, Michael Spindler and Gil Emilio, couldn't stop the company from struggling as competitors launched fresh products that increasingly outperformed Apple's at lower prices. It was a company which was losing an enormous amount of money. It was still bringing in revenue, but it just wasn't making profit, so it was losing a huge amount of money each year. That was really kind of the nadir for Apple. That was when everything went wrong, and it's unclear of how close it came to bankruptcy, but some people say it was within 90 days of having to close shop. By the late 90s, Apple was on the brink of bankruptcy. It needed to do something drastic as quickly as possible. The return of co-founder Steve Jobs was seen by many as Apple's only hope. But the demanding pioneer was busy building a whole new empire. This morning, at its offices in Silicon Valley, California, the company is about to get a first look at its new trademark. After leaving Apple in 1985, Jobs Steve Jobs has started Next, a computer company aiming to create high-end hardware and software. Excitement. Well, I've forgotten how much work it actually is to start a company. It's a lot of work. and. You've got to do everything. You've got to come up with a name. You've got to come up with a logo. You, I mean, in addition to designing the product, you've got to figure out what to design. You've got to figure out how you're going to get it to the marketplace. You've got to do a part number system. You've got to go get bank accounts. You've got to set up charts, general ledgers, get a management information system, get a little kitchen set up, get a coffee maker, all this stuff. You know, it isn't like this should be something new. 
That's one. But, I mean, I agree that, let me, let me back up. So somebody's got to say, here's what we can do, and we can make it happen, and here's the level of thing we can ship in 16 months. And what I hear him saying is, forget it. And boy, that just makes me smoke. Jobs spent 12 years away from Apple, notably helping Next Computers develop an innovative operating system. However, there was no doubt where Jobs' heart and ambitions really lay. The first week or so that I worked with him at Next, it was so clear that he was out for Apple revenge and also that he was going to go back to Apple because he had something to prove. At this point, he'd been thrown out of the company that he gave birth to. It's like your child throwing you out. And, uh, and he was going to go back and make that company a success. Just how Steve Jobs would bring Apple back to life would revolutionize the computer industry and transform the way we live in the 21st century. The Apple brand has clearly suffered from neglect, and we need to bring it back. In 1996, Apple was on the verge of bankruptcy and desperately needed a new operating system for its Mac computers. So in December that year, CEO Gil Emilio bought Steve Jobs' next firm for its software, bringing Apple's founder back into the company. Steve Jobs coming back to Apple, it was kind of a feel-good moment in the sense that, you know, here's one of the founders come back to the company that he started. But I don't think that anyone could have predicted at that point that you know, just that act of Steve Jobs returning was going to be what was going to restore Apple to profitability. It took seven months for Steve Jobs to convince the Apple board to fire CEO Gil Emilio. Pleased to announce today that I'm going to drop the interim title. At 42 years old, Jobs finally became the chief executive officer of Apple. Apple needed Steve Jobs as much as Steve Jobs needed Apple. It was his playground. And when he came in, for the first 30 months, he worked for a dollar a year. He said, a year. He said, I'll come and I want to fix this. The Apple brand has clearly suffered from neglect and we need to bring it back. He spent that whole time while he was at Next learning how to be a really good CEO. And that's what changed. He understood how to make a company operate and how to run it. And those who worked with him after he came back to Apple have a very different idea of Steve than those of us who worked with him before. So it was very clear that he changed. I don't think he ever got nicer, but he changed. To save the company he loved, Steve Jobs needed to take immediate and often brutal decisions. When Steve Jobs came back, he fired a lot of people, which is probably not necessarily a good thing for morale, but was a good thing for Apple's bottom line. He also got rid of a lot of the product lines, which were not particularly profitable. And so you're going to see the product line get much simpler, and you're going to see the product line get much better. Here's to the crazy ones. Apple's next challenge was to convince the rest of the world that Apple was worth buying from again. The round pegs in the square holes. The ones who see things differently. They're not the Think Different advertising campaign was an attempt to relaunch the Apple brand, to bring it back to the counterculture infused values that Steve Jobs first envisioned back in 1976 when the company was founded. Is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. Think Different was another incredibly brilliant campaign that really started to attract not only the creatives, but people who wanted to be creative. It honors those people who have changed the world. Some of them are living, some of them are not. But the ones that aren't, as you'll see, you know that if they'd ever used a computer, it would have been a Mac. <laughs> I think the Think Different campaign was the inflection point that, that took it from a downhill slide to, OK, now, now we're going to go on up. That really is Steve's greatest gift, is that he, he is incredibly emotionally intelligent. He understands what people want before they do. He understands what they're going to do with things before they do. And that's what he capitalized on when he came back with the Think Different campaign. So now he realizes, okay, we have a, 
we have a cult here. Let's, let's protect that cult, let's feed that cult and see if we can get it to grow. <laughs> this group of die-hard London Mac users meet monthly to share news and information on Apple. Like most fans of the company, they reject the idea that they're like members of a cult. I wouldn't see it as a cult. Uh, I have a very different opinion of a cult. So this software update here is for the operating system. And Mac App Store is now where you're getting the updates for the apps. Siri, do you love me? You're looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> Siri, is Apple a religion? Apple's website may be able to answer your question. <laughs> oh, for me, Apple feels like a, an old friend. Um, it does feel like a... You know, a company that I've been able to trust all my life. Um, you know, they've always pushed things, they've always pushed the future. Type C cable. I was at primary school. I was in, I can remember the exact Mac I used as well. Uh, it was in year three of school. Um, I remember just being able to draw on a computer screen was something completely different. The keyboard was brilliant, it was translucent. The mouse, you, if you moved it around, you had a multicolored ball, so you could tell if it was moving or not. They had spent so much effort to make you smile compared to a beige box, which is boring. Apple's next product certainly put a smile on the faces of the fans and the company's accountants. In 1998, the iMac G3 arrived. A lot of people will remember the iMac G3 as the kind of the blobby, colourful Macintosh from the late 1990s. It's kind of translucent blue, coloured after the sea on some Australian beach. Really, I would say that the iMac is the machine which comes at the same time that Apple suddenly becomes profitable again. So really, that is one of the most significant products in Apple history. It was a machine that everyone could afford. And it was beautiful, but it was more than that. It was very, very easy to kind of pick up. It was very, very easy to feel connected to it and for it to feel like an extension of you. Designed by Jonathan Ive, the iMac G3 was a transformative success for Apple. In its first five months, it sold close to 800,000 iMac G3 units. It's the product which introduces the world to not only the return of Steve Jobs, but also Johnny Ive, who becomes an enormously significant figure in Apple's history as the designer of so many of its later products. And this was the first time that they had worked together. From losing around a billion US dollars in 1997, the company posted a 309 million US dollar profit just one year later. And this was just the beginning. Steve Jobs and Apple's next target was the music industry. The record publishers were forcing young people to buy an entire album that they would listen to only for a few months on their MP3 player. And the music publishing industry was almost ready to be destroyed. Apple wanted to do something, not just a MP3 player. It actually took on the challenge of saving the music publishing industry. The launch of the iTunes music service in 2001 allowed users to rip, burn and listen to individual music tracks legally and easily. It almost single-handedly pulled the rug from music pirates and paved the way for Apple's next hardware release. In October 2001, the iPod portable music player was released. I think the iMac was probably the product that relaunched Apple but the innovations came quite fast, one after the other. So the iPod was truly revolutionary. iTunes was a brilliant idea. iTunes and iPod function together. You can't have one without the other. Again, you suddenly had this closed proprietary system, but everyone wanted in. Apple had always been a company that was willing to experiment, but it hadn't ever managed to do these completely successfully. With the iPod, then suddenly it manages to take a very promising product, the MP3 player, and using some beautiful design, invented as this product that everyone wants. Many attempts have been made to produce a successful portable MP3 player, 
notably from Asian companies like Seihan, Kowon and Creative. Technologic. But Apple's iPod, with its innovative design, backed by compelling marketing, came to dominate the market, becoming, by 2007, the fastest-selling digital music player of all time. It changed the entire music industry. Steve Jobs' next trick was to set the bar for all mobile technology. Today, we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. An iPod a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. So after a few years, the iPod, people start saying, well, as soon as someone invents a phone which is able to play music, that's going to decimate the iPod market. So Apple thinks that's fine, but we'll invent the phone. And that's when you get the, the iPhone. The iPhone spawned a whole breed of smartphone rivals. Manufacturers from Samsung to Sony entered the market, sparking a new war for the supremacy of the mobile phone industry. In July 2008, Apple launched the App Store with 500 apps for the iPhone. In its first weekend, 10 million apps were downloaded. Like the success of iTunes before it, this was a key moment in the commodification of digital content and paved the way for future Apple products. There are many companies that do one thing great and that's all they ever do. So I think what the iPod iTunes followed by the iPhone made everybody realize Apple wasn't just a one-hit wonder. It had something in its DNA that it had the ability to make a continuing series of great products. By the time the iPad came out, everybody expected the iPad to come out and be a great product. With its proliferation of products, Apple's fan base was growing, and in 2001, Steve Jobs gave his congregation a church, the Apple Store. Tim Kobe is the designer of the Apple stores. People would see Apple advertising, they would see their products, and it would drive traffic to the, to the resellers. But the resellers were also selling, you know, 20 other computers. And so they were typically being countersold away from the product they came in for to a one where the retailer had a better margin or uh, was able to convince them it was a more, more appropriate product. Okay, so this is our... R&D area. Steve Jobs took a typically hands-on role in the design of the stores. The idea of Steve, you know, criticizing the, the screw heads on these metal panels and, and uh, you know, the mock-ups and things that we went through were, were uh, you know, it was an extraordinary time. Steve really understood what the Apple brand was about. All of the qualities that we were putting into the retail store ultimately went through him as a filter that this was Apple brand qualities that, that, were, that were going into the space. He used design as a competitive tool. He used it as a, a way of creating compelling experience for people. Um, and I think he probably used design in a much more sophisticated way than most companies, than most companies do. The store is divided into four parts. The, the plans for the Apple stores received a lot of criticism from the industry. It was thought to be a huge risk to open a specific retail store just to sell Apple products. People were saying it was going to be a big mistake, that they were risking millions of dollars on opening an Apple store. But ultimately, the real risk was probably listening to those pundits, listening to those people who were saying it was risky. Within three years of the first Apple store opening in 2001, Apple became the fastest retailer in history to reach one billion US dollars in sales. And there are now over 500 stores across the globe. They've really grown their network of Apple stores in China enormously over the last few years. They opened a store in Singapore uh, last year and they're pushing to open uh, Apple stores in India as well. So they've certainly made uh, nods to embracing that market. 
I think opening the Apple stores was a brilliant idea because it created that sense of, I'm going into somewhere special to buy a special product. It's about creating that complete, total customer experience. Steve Jobs' world-changing vision for his company was getting fulfilled. Thanks for coming. But in 2003, Jobs was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And in 2011, he passed away. Apple was now a huge success, but with its visionary leader gone, how would the company cope in new markets and facing aggressive new rivals? In 2011, Apple became the world's most valuable publicly traded company. I love it. On August the 24th of the same year, Steve Jobs resigned from the company he had founded and six weeks later died of cancer. He was 56 years old. So thank you very much to our extended families out there. I was devastated. I felt that I'd lost a, you know, um, a close friend. Never met the man, never seen him in person only ever kind of watched him from afar. But uh, it was a real sense of loss, a real what sense of loss. He made design cool. He inspired people to like computing. The quote from Blade Runner, that the light that burns twice as bright lasts half as long. And that was Steve Jobs. Thank you. When Steve Jobs died, there's absolutely no doubt that it affected Apple in the sense that suddenly the company was robbed of its visionary leader. People thought that Apple would suddenly crumble without this visionary figurehead behind it. Apple had struggled once before without Steve Jobs, but this time Jobs had groomed someone to replace him, Tim Cook. Tim Cook is not the same kind of leader that Steve Jobs was. He's not necessarily a visionary leader, but he's a great, great business strategist. And uh, to give some sense of how successful Apple has been since uh, Steve Jobs died, when Steve Jobs died, Apple's market cap was about 347 billion. Today, it's over 900 billion, and it's on its way this year to potentially becoming the world's first trillion dollar company in history. I love Apple. I consider it the privilege of a lifetime to have worked here for almost 14 years, and I am very excited about this new role. Under Tim Cook, Apple has grown globally, significantly exploiting the rising power of the Asian consumer. Apple is one of those real amazing success stories for China. 2010, 2011, they arrive and they all start buying smartphones. Prior to that, they were not really a major force in the world, Chinese consumers. And Apple comes in at the right time, smartphones growing very rapidly. One of the things that we've seen in the last few years has been an enormous sort of growing impact and importance to markets like, for example, China and India, sort of developing markets. And these are ones which Apple has been very, very quick to embrace. Tim Cook's actually talked about the fact that Apple's products today are designed for a Chinese audience in some senses. If you look at the gold iPhone, which Apple introduced a few years ago, that very much is a phone which has been very successful in China and quite possibly was aimed at the Chinese market to begin with. 2015 is kind of the high mark where Apple's got like 25% of the China market. It's responsible for half of their global growth is China. And in the process of this, they establish a well-known, incredibly well-respected brand. A luxury brand is really what they are. iPad, 
我的粘性完全使用习惯完全是在 iOS 上，在 iCloud 上。In China now, the App Store brings in more revenue than the App Store in the U.S. So there is a sort of a, a shift between the two markets, and I think that that's something that Tim Cook has been very, very aware that he needs to kind of embrace that these are no longer markets which can just be sort of taken as, you know, a, 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 as a nice added extra. This is where the battles of the future are really going to be fought, and Tim Cook has really embraced that. One of the major battles facing Apple in China is the threat of highly innovative rivals all trying to take a bite out of Apple's market. Apple has succeeded in China as much as any foreign company can hope to succeed. But then, what always happens here is phase two, which is local competitors come on, and they come on very strong. And that's what's been happening the last since about 2015 till now. It's just one very smart. Well-run local competitor after another, Vivo, Oppo, Xiaomi, Huawei, and now Apple is just fighting. But that is that is life here. I think some of the difficulties in Asia has been price. So a lot of lower-priced products, phones you can get, competition from local. Brands like Xiaomi, like Samsung, and so on. Samsung does incredibly well in Asia. So, very strong mobile phone competitors, very strong computer competitors like Lenovo. So, in each one of the categories in which Apple is very good, it has faced very strong local competition. And I think that's been difficult. It's also priced at a price point, which is higher than most Asian competitors are willing to pay for. Being at the top of the tree makes Apple not only a big target for any rivals, but also for any criticism. Battery life issues, sticky keyboards, environmental policies, and labor violations all threaten to tarnish Apple's reputation and challenge the loyalty of even its most devoted fans. Most people are feeling bullied by Apple. You know, they upgraded the system on their iPhone 6, then iPhone immediately became almost unusably slow. Now, who's that helping? Who is that helping?、Um, it's not helping the customer. There are 1.3 billion active Apple devices being used around the world, but to stay at the top of the tree, Apple needs to keep giving customers what they want. And that's innovation. I really hope they will continue pushing the boundaries in terms of innovation in all those industries they're they're playing in. I'm afraid that they're losing their you know their mojo, that they're losing that edge. It hasn't been the leader it once was in terms of innovation, and it's it's probably difficult for for any company to sustain that over over a long period of time. But where I think they should be looking to be successful is getting back to focusing on what matters to people. Solve the thousand songs in your pocket problem, not how thick is my、uh, iPhone problem. What matters is what does this technology do to make my life easier and make my life better. Tim Cook is an incredible, an incredible CEO and an incredible steward of the assets he was left, and has taken those and grown them and made an amazingly high value. High-value company, but he's not a visionary, and that's that's a, an issue I think for Apple. Apple has evolved hugely over the past 42 years. From being a company rooted in counterculture rebellion, it is now a massive capitalist machine. Whether the next chapter for the company will see Apple growing further or being laid low by rivals is yet to be seen. What we know here historically is companies rise and fall. You never stay at the top for very long until somebody comes in, and it's always better to be second or third or be the underdog of an industry because you have somewhere to look up to, and you have a competitor you want to beat. What Apple has managed to do is diversify in a way that they hadn't previously. 
Today, the Apple stock price is less reflective of one product than at any point in the company's history. So even though the iPhone is still by a, a wide margin Apple's biggest seller, Apple's services industry, for example, is enormous. It now represents around 30% of Apple's revenue. That's things like Apple Music, which now has about 50 million worldwide subscribers, um, iCloud, other services like this. So in some ways, Apple has continued to put out sort of hit products, but not necessarily in the way that they did under Steve Jobs. I actually think that despite the fact that at some point logic dictates that Apple will fall, I think Apple is looking more secure and stable than at any point in its history. If you look at Apple, their real competitors today are not computer companies and so on. They're Google, Amazon, those kinds of companies, incredibly creative, innovative companies as well. But it depends what Apple has in the pipeline. I, I don't have a crystal ball.